welcome you to this afternoon's session of the effect of soiling on PV performance. Um, please bear with me because this is the second time uh, only that I've delivered this, uh, this content. So I'm tr still trying to get the delivery uh, correct. Uh, my name is Michael Middlemast. I am the category manager for renewables here at uh, the Seawood Group. I operate out of our office here in uh, Tampa, Florida, but our, um, our main headquarters and manufacturing plant is in the northeast of England. Uh, my role is to oversee our renewable testing range. So I look after our solar testers and uh, I travel to sites uh, around uh, the US and around the world um, training on our products and also getting feedback from the community the solar community on how we can improve um, our offering, including our instruments and our um, our software package. Now, recently, something that really came to my attention on a site uh, out in California was soiling, and um, the panels were really badly soiled. So this kind of inspired me to create this presentation that I'm going to give to you today about soiling. Um, we're going to cover what it is, how it happens, where it happens, um, what we can do to fix it, and how we can prove to the user of the PV, so the owner of the plant, how we can how we can prove that the soiling is really causing um, a loss of generation and in turn a loss of return on their investment. So before we get started, I, I must just read out this brief uh, disclaimer to you. Okay, so. Basically, this presentation is not to be considered any replacements for any of the standards uh, that I reference. Uh, reference figures are correct at the time of this presentation. Uh, for any clarification, please contact me or a representative, representative of Seaward. Um, we don't accept any responsibility for any of the information we give here that is used in error, and no part of this presentation um, shall be deemed a form of contract or uh, of training, and um, please do refer back to me for any queries. Um, persons performing any electrical tests uh, must be fully competent to do so, and the safety of our uh, operators is the absolute um, paramount subject we should be, uh, we should be uh, looking at. Your safety is paramount. Okay, so in this presentation, I'm gonna be describing um, PV testing, we're going to be connecting the PV systems. I'm going to show you examples of that. So please do be careful. And um, one of the things we do need to cover when you are in the field is your personal protection equipment. Okay, so do be very aware of what you're connecting to. We need rubber insulated gloves as your first line of defense. Um, use leather gloves also. PV systems can operate up to 1,000 volts, 1,500 volts. So arc flash is a real concern. And unfortunately, not all PV systems are clearly labeled. Um, and that means you might not be aware of what you're connecting to. So perform an on-site evaluation before you connect a unit. Okay, so now that's the health and safety kind of stuff out of the way. What exactly is soiling? Okay, what, what is soiling? We, we say this word uh, soiling and we need to really narrow down um, what that covers, because it does co cover a broad spectrum of uh, things. So the term soiling is used to describe an accumulation of snow, of dust, of dirt, of leaves, and bird droppings on PV panels. So that's what we call soiling, okay? Now, the performance of a PV module decreases by surface soiling, and the PV power loss increases with an increase in the quantity of soiling on the PV panel. So in real terms, all that means is if you have a little bit of dust, you have a little bit of loss. If you have a lot of dust, you have a lot of loss. So it scales up, okay? So soiling is a big issue, and I don't think the end user, okay, maybe the homeowner, the business owner, the plant owner, they don't realize how bad it is. OK, and we need to quantify that for them. So that's what we're going to talk about today. What is soiling and how do we prove it to that end user? Well, I have a nice little phrase here which hopefully could help us. OK, soiling equals shading, which equals power loss. OK, 
And the one thing I didn't add on here, which I probably should have, power loss equals loss of cash. Okay, so that's where it's going to affect you the most in whatever kind of system um, you have installed. For instance, if you're a utility scale uh, installer and your panels are soiled, you're not going to be able to output enough power and therefore you will bring down the ROI. Similar for a residential client, definitely for a PPA, a power purchase agreement. Okay, when we have that on a commercial building or utility scale, we need to guarantee power output. And if we can't do that, well, then um, we're not going to be able to um, to uh, honor the, the power purchase agreement that we've made. So soiling equals shading, which equals power loss. Soiling also does a couple of other things, which we're going to cover a little bit further on in the presentation. So, as I mentioned in the previous slide, um, the soiling differs. OK, so it's very rare that we immediately get 100 percent, 80 percent soiling on the panels. So it accumulates uh, the dust buildup and aggregates over time. OK, and dust layers. So the layer of dust on the panels can vary depending on your environment and your location. And dust can be generated by many sources. So obviously wind, traffic, cattle, maybe even volcanic fallout, which is not you know, entirely uh, common, but it does happen. But the purpose of this slide is, if dust gets worse over time, then we need to schedule our maintenance to prevent that dust, that soiling, over that time period. OK, so when we first install the panels, perhaps there will be no soiling. OK, a month later, there will be two months later, there will be even more. So we need to plan in our schedule of cleaning and maintenance in line with the environment that you're dealing with. So if you have if you're in an area where you have a lot of dust, OK, a lot of sand, perhaps you're in the Middle East, you're in a very hot country, perhaps you're in the Mojave Desert in California or you're somewhere in the middle of um, Hyderabad or um, uh, Uttar Pradesh in, in, in India, all very hot, dusty uh, locations, um, we should be very, very careful and we should monitor that dust and what kind of uh, time scale we think that it's going to increase with. OK, but not only environmentally, but kind of where we are in position to other things around us. So if we're very much near a highway, OK, and the plant is right there, we could have pollution that is affecting and causing soiling uh, onto the panels themselves. So be very conscious of where you are. Uh, this picture on the right hand side um, that you can see of the presentation, this actually was just north of Fresno uh, in California. And um, this was again, we're in the middle of the desert here. And this client in particular was having issues with his uh, instrument, his solar, seaward solar instrument. And he was telling me, Michael, your instrument, it's not giving me accurate results. I should be getting this from these panels, but it keeps showing me that I'm getting less output. Your instrument is wrong. So we had a lot of backwards and forwards and we got the instrument here to in Florida to test. We recalibrated it. We did everything the client asked. We sent it back out. Still, he was getting the same results and he wasn't happy. So what I did was I traveled out to the site and I could see straight away the problem was soiling. So you can see in the bottom left hand corner, I rubbed the panel and immediately um, he was uh, admitting that it was the soiling that was causing the problem. But how do I prove that to him? OK, how do I prove it? Um, well, I have a method to prove um, how soiling is affecting output a little bit later on in the presentation. For now, just getting back to the location and how we could understand uh, how dust and soiling gets worse over time, there are some resources available to us. OK, so this um, article online at sciencedirect.com is a great article all about soiling. And here we have the cause of dust accumulation. Now, we're not going to go through all of this, but you can see the environmental factors, the dust type, the location and installation factors. OK, and we can kind of determine what is going to be affecting our plant. And as such, we can maybe plan in a little bit better what our maintenance and cleaning schedule should be. Um, similarly, we can look at dust intensity around the globe with this dust intensity map. 
Now, this is measuring the micron layer of dust, and it gives us an average for each area. So the darker the zone uh, here on this map, the, um, the worse the, uh, the, the dust and the soiling will be. So here, if we look at, uh, at North Africa, um, we can see that we have fours. It's very dark. OK, so we've got we've got very high intensity of, uh, of dust there. Similarly, in um, Argentina, Chile, uh, we're at a three uh, parts of, uh, of, of Mongolia. Um, but we can also see areas that are quite misleading because number two uh, is the United States. And it said the dust intensity is quite low. But then we have to localize that to maybe California. OK, and then if we look at Greenland, Iceland, these are going to very low for dust, but they will be high for snow coverage. OK, so what I would like you to do is when you're considering this in your own end plans, really consider where you are and it shouldn't be uniform across all your projects. That's my kind of main point here. If you do a project in California, it's not going to be the same as a project in Minnesota. So we need to localize our uh, maintenance schedules. The image here on the right, um, this isn't one of mine. I picked this up from um, some, one of the community members on LinkedIn. And you can see just how severe the dust layer can get in a zone four. Um, it really is very pronounced and it's gonna cause us some very big problems uh, moving forward. So the takeaway from this is, okay, consider your location both on a global scale with regard to dust intensity, but also on a local scale with regard to what's around you. Okay, are you in a desert? Are you in a temperate climate? Where are you situated uh, in the world? So I mentioned that soiling does cause shading, um, but it doesn't just cause shading. Okay, soiling causes us some other problems. So take a look at this. You can see that the soiling is causing a hotspot. So we can see this with any old thermal camera. You don't need a very expensive IR or thermal imaging camera to, to get this sort of picture. But a thin layer, and you've probably seen this as PB for professionals, has accumulated on the bottom row of cells of the panels. OK, and at first glance, you may think, well, that's probably not going to cause any problems. It's it's only a little bit of the panel. But what happens is um, the current can't flow properly in the panel and we get increased resistance, which is then dissipated as uh, uh, in thermal energies as heat. So that's essentially those glowing yellow spots are is power loss. OK, so we're not only losing it because of shading, but also because the soiling is causing hot spots. Now, the shading is lowering the amount of irradiance that hits the panel and the hot spot is bringing down the voltage because voltage is directly affected by cell temperature. So it's a double whammy. Now, if this was across an entire table, can you imagine if we had a very large 100, 200 megawatt plant, even a small plant, if we multiply up that hotspot across the whole field, we're losing a heck of a lot of generation. Now, this could be caused by um, rain hitting the ground, splashing up onto the panels. It could be that the, the, uh, there's been vehicles driven down the middle of the table, which is splashing up and covering the panels. It could be that we had dirty rain. Whatever it may be, we need to find a way to overcome it. So the thing I noticed about this picture is the panels are very low to the ground. OK, so if we lifted them up and got some clearance for the ground, we wouldn't have that splash up. So maybe that's a solution. Um, looking at this second picture. So I mentioned soiling isn't just dust and dirt, right? It's also bird droppings, leaves, etc. So you can see the impact that this bird dropping has on this panel. This is one small bird dropping. OK, and imagine that again, scaled up across 100, 200 megawatts, no matter what the size, we have to scale up this problem. So you can see that not only is dust intensity, um, snow, whatever it may be, causing shading, but also we're getting quite severe hotspots on the plant. So soiling causes shading and hotspots, which means power loss, which means money lost. So soiling equals lost money. But again, how do we prove this to a layman? How do we prove this to the client? Okay, 
I could show them this picture and you're all PV professionals here and you can probably see straight away, well, that, that's not good. But what does that actually mean to the end user, to the homeowner, Mr. Smith, Ms. Mrs. Smith? How do we prove it to them? Well, we're going to cover that shortly. But first, we need a solution to that soiling problem. Okay, so I'm going to go on to how we prove it. But first, I want to tell you what the solution is. So we're going to work a little bit backwards. The solution is cleaning. Very simple. If something's dirty, you should clean it. So we have many tools available. There are a lot of innovations in this sector. There are automatic robots that are doing cleaning. Um, further to the feedback from the first presentation I gave this morning, um, there is also vacuum um, units available. So if you're in the middle of the desert and you can't get uh, any water, okay, then of course vacuuming off the dust would be a better uh, consideration. Also in, in California where I do uh, a lot of work, there's also, there are a lot of areas that have water shortages, okay. So again, that means that uh, vacuuming or another method uh, might be uh, a good solution for you. Um, now, I have um, prepared just a, a small video of some cleaning happening in the Middle East. So when I tried to do this this morning, the video didn't actually work. So I'm going to try again. So forgive me if I go off. If the audio goes off for a second, please bear with me. I will be back with you in a second. So I'm going to try and get this uh, uh, video to run here. Okay, so hopefully this runs. I'm not sure this is working. Um, if the video doesn't work, I, I don't know if you can see the, uh, the, the pictures here, um, but basically the, um, we have a JCB, big tractor, uh, with a cleaning brush. And what we found was as the brush was sweeping across the panels, the dust is just thrown up in the air, and that's really just moving the problem to another part of the site. And when you have a 260 watt megawatt plant to take care of, and this is the Mohammed Al bin Rakhtoum solar farm in Dubai, um, then it's a real issue. Um, I'm really sorry, folks. It looks like the video again isn't working. Um, so we will uh, we'll have to give that one a miss, but I will send out the link. It's on our YouTube channel. So I do apologize for that. Okay. So getting back to our presentation, and I really will have to get those videos to start working. Um, so to get a cleaning contract, we first got to convince people. Okay, so how do we convince people to, uh, to do that? How do we convince them to sign us up to doing some cleaning? Well, using our range of testing tools, what we can do is uh, we can test prior to your first cleaning session. OK, clean the panels thoroughly with the appropriate method for the location. And then we can test when they're clean. And what that will do is that will give us an exact. An exact uh, real direct result of performance increase, because we can take voltage, we can take short circuit current, we can run an IV curve trace and we can compare the two. So you can show your clients directly the difference there and then. You don't have to wait for a report. Um, for instance, if this was a residential project, you could um, invite Mr. and Mrs. Smith out and say, listen, your panels are really dirty. Look, when I test them, this is what I get. Um, but if I was to clean them, this is what you can get. So using a handheld test tool like the Seawood PV210 or 200, we can prove that in real terms uh, for the client. So what I prepared for us today is actually a little case study around this, uh, an example in the field, if you will. So in order for us to convince the plant owner to clean their modules and show our expected values, okay, sorry, we need to show them our expected values versus our measured values. Okay, so what I'm saying is here, 
when I look at these solar panels, this is what they should be outputting, okay? But this is what they're actually outputting using my test device. So we could do that for string voltage. So as a quick example, if we have a 40 volt panel and we have 10 panels in series, we should see 400 volts, okay? Not taking into account the temperature coefficient. For string current at 1,000 watts per meter squared, if we have nine amps, then at 500 watts per meter squared, we should have 4.5 amps using the irradiance factor. So very quickly, we can tell just from voltage and short circuit current what the output should be. So um, this is the case study and the example of where I was. Okay, so this is in Clovis, uh, California, in Fresno. And standard test condition values, as you probably all know, are 1,000 watts per meter squared, 25 degrees Celsius. And the standard test condition value for these panels that we were going to test was 37.4 VDC, and ISC was 9 amps ADC. So that's what we should have been seeing, because the average irradiance in that area on that day was around about 900 to 1,000 to 1, watts per meter squared. OK, and you can notice in the top right hand corner, um, there is a good picture there of when we went up on the roof. There was actually a ground fault on this system as well, which we managed to detect with the Seaward PV210. But you can see the handprint on the panel. OK, so that's how badly um, uh, shaded by soiling these panels were that you could put your hand on and you could quite see clearly see it was very blue underneath. Now, again, I have another video here of me actually performing the tests in the field. Uh, again, it didn't work this morning and the last video didn't work, but we're gonna try again. You know, we've gotta try these things. So if you bear with me one second, we'll see if we can make this video available for you. And no, it looks like, <laughs> I'm sorry. It looks like that video was also um, a failure to launch. Um, so what we'll do is we'll we'll head into the uh, the values which we extrapolated rather than the video. So using uh, the the formula that we've uh, we talked about on the previous slide, we calculated that under this uh, temperature and this irradiance, we should see 37.4 volts VOC, and we should see uh, 8.1 amps um, short circuit current. That's what we should have seen using the PV200, uh, 210 rather, device, which should give us around about 336 watts, approximately, estimate. So when we actually tested the panel, which you can see is incredibly soiled, um, we actually came out with 33 volts, okay? And we measured 5.64 ISC. So we've lost nearly four amps, okay? We, we, we've had a 30% loss in current. And all in all that, we kind of estimated that as the client was losing 44% of their generation. Okay. So with the PV150 or the PV200 or 210, we can demonstrate to the client how much they're losing in real terms there and then. Here you go. You got this. I cleaned it. Test. You've got this. So you can show the, the client in real terms using a very professional device um, what their losses were. So um, we will um, send to you the videos which I've tried to get going. As I say, the first one was the module cleaning in the desert. The second was um, um, uh, this uh, image of me here it was the video of this doing the test. And you can see it in real time for yourself. But uh, there is a problem here. Um, what if we can't clean the panels? What should we do? So here is a scenario for you. You have a plant that you need to commission, okay? And the plant has been installed for a couple of months. You were just waiting for a connection. And over those months, the dust and dirt has accumulated on the panels. Or for instance, you're going back to a job site um, that you need to do a performance verification on. You may not have access to clean those panels. Machines are very expensive. There could be water shortages. You may not have the personnel. There may not be the budget. So you might not be able to clean all of the panels in the site. So what can we do to make sure that the results we get using our seaward instrument 
are accurate. Like this gentleman I mentioned earlier who had the problem and said that his seaweed instrument wasn't working correctly, um, he couldn't clean his plant. So what we have to do is work out what our soiling factor is, okay? What offset from STC values should we use, okay, for this plant? So what we do is we remove a single panel. We don't need all of them, okay? We're going to extrapolate up. And this is a very soiled panel. And what I want you to do is measure that panel while it's soiled, okay? And make sure it's in the same inclination as the rest of the array. Sometimes tough on, an, on a tracker, I appreciate. So we have then the results. We have the dirty results. So clean off that single panel, okay? And then measure the clean panel, okay? And then using those clean results and the dirty results for a single panel, we can then figure out what the percentage difference is and we can use that as a soiling factor for the entire plant. Okay, so I'm not saying get two data sets here. I mean, maybe spend a day, half a day testing a variety of panels across the site using this method, then we can aggregate the results. But if you can't clean all of them, at least clean one and figure out what your soiling um, uh, factor should be and how much you should offset from VOC. There are a couple of other things we need to incorporate. Um, the IEC standard recommends that we should incorporate 0.5% natural degradation for every year the system has been installed. Um, LID, sorting, there are a couple of other things, but really soiling, um, I found in most cases, is the biggest drain um, from, the, uh, from the system. So um, what can we use to test? Well, I've mentioned throughout the presentation the Seawood PV210. So this will give us voltage, ISC, uh, continuity of earth. We will get insulation resistance and also a curve trace. The PV150 is really a workhorse unit. It'll do everything apart from the, uh, the curve tracing and it's more cost effective. Um, and then the Sol Utility Pro is really our... Um, larger unit so it's at 1500 volts 40 amps okay so you can test multiple strings in parallel with that instrument and you can test 1500 volt sites so with these units and these instruments and the the backing of us here at seaward um, you can prove to your clients um, that there is an issue with soiling uh, on their plant so what i would like to do now is i I'm quite active on, on LinkedIn. I like talking with other members of the solar community. And I asked them three questions. And the first question was, do you factor cleaning into your O&M schedule? Are your clients aware of production loss due to soiling? And do you clean panels prior to testing or do you add in that soiling factor after the fact? Okay, so these very three, three questions about how Operators are currently dealing with, um, with, with soiling. And you can see from this image uh, on the right-hand side, that was the home that, that had 43% reduction uh, in power output due to soiling. Okay, you can see how bad that looks. <laughs> so first of all, we had a comment from, um, from Brian at Clean Your Solar. Uh, Clean Your Solar are a great uh, company based out in California, I believe, who are doing cleaning. Uh, and uh, an installation work. Um, he says, uh, Michael, production loss will vary by region and other factors, as we discussed earlier. Here in Southern California, the soiling factor can be higher in areas that are dry and dusty, not to mention other factors, bird droppings, tree sap, pollen, etc. Uh, the problem that uh, Brian saw on the O&M side of the residential in installations is that he feels that window cleaners Okay, not electricians, but window cleaners recommend that people get their solar cleaned every three months. Um, Brian says that unless the soiling is that bad, he thinks that's overkill. So again, this is what I mentioned earlier. Brian is confirming that we need to localize what our O&M and cleaning schedule should be. He also goes on to talk about um, commercial systems where PPAs are very much a, a bigger factor. And so we need uh, more considerations and, and more cleaning. Um, 
We then got some comments from John Nisler. He's the CEO of PSIDA. Um, they, they work in the solar and the, uh, the wind and power storage industry. Uh, his answer to the first question was, he always cleans the panels prior to testing, which is good practice. He factors in the cleaning cost of O&M and to try and reduce the frequency of cleaning. And he really talks about it openly with his customers. So I think, John, uh, those are the three perfect answers we should really do. Um, we should really give, sorry, to those questions. Um, be honest, clean prior to testing and factor in the cost of cleaning whenever we can. Um, I also um, got a comment from a friend of mine, Aaron. Uh, Aaron is the CEO of Bonsai Solar, great company. They do drone inspections. He also has some good innovative products in the work. Um, it's really, he said, an underserved area of the O&M uh, space and where water, availabil water availability isn't an issue. It really is a problem. And he says design, uh, really plant design, is where we should be compensating for the soiling. Remember, in the beginning, I suggested that we raise the table rather than have water splash onto the panels. So it's a great, uh, great comment there by Aaron. And um, you can, of course, get uh, drone inspections in the RGB spectrum to point out specific areas of shading. And then you can send someone directly to that point with the instrument. Uh, Haley, um, the Managing Director of Solar Panel Cleaning Services, is actually based in the United Kingdom, and he comes across this a lot. Now, the main point um, here that uh, Haley raised is that um, panels are left for long periods of time without cleaning occurring. And what happens is the modules become permanently stained, okay? So if you're leaving the, the soiling on the panels for a long period of time, um, it could actually affect your warranty because you haven't taken care of them. And for larger commercial systems, he says, um, we should definitely put it into our cleaning costs and also the equipment hire for getting to those sites, not just the labor costs, etc. So um, today we've covered uh, what soiling is, how to think about how it affects us in our particular area and where we're installing. Um, we then looked at our expected and our measured values and what they can show us in terms of generation loss. Um, we then looked at a case study uh, out in California, which was very dusty. I also tried to show you a couple of videos which didn't work, but never mind. And I also introduced you to the Seaward range of test tools, which is available globally uh, in the United States, in Europe, in Asia, Africa, uh, Australasia, really everywhere, uh, uh, Southern America, ev everywhere our units are available. So I'd like to open up the floor now to any questions you may have. Um, if you don't have any questions, that's absolutely fine as well. Um, you can contact me at uh, michaelm at seaward.com. That's michaelm at seaward.com. Please do uh, get in touch with any questions. I'm more than happy to, to take follow-up questions. Um, you can also link up with me on LinkedIn if that's somewhere that you're active. Um, I post up interesting solar things. Uh, there are presentations on there, past webinars you can access. And also you can ask questions and get involved in the discussion because quite often we will have uh, nice uh, group talks going um, from, from a post. I ask for comments and questions um, to be asked. So um, doesn't look like any questions are coming through right now, uh, which is a little bit different to uh, this morning. Uh, which we, we had uh, we had a lot of questions coming through. So it just leaves me to thank those people that uh, joined today. Um, thank you, uh, Claudio. Thank you, Densa. How are you doing there, mate? I hope you're doing well. Um, thank you, Dr. Robinson, uh, Elizabeth, uh, the Eric, George, Jonathan, Joshua, Keaton, Christopher, Marina, Michael, um, Sinjin, Simon, Sona, and, and everyone else that has joined. Oh, we do have a couple of questions here. How to cal calculate soiling losses before the installation of the rooftop projects, various various locations? Okay, Keaton, that's a very good question. Um, really, we can't. Okay, we can take a best guess. So what I would suggest is take an aggregate of the all of the installations in a similar area. Okay, so maybe we could have a database of soiling. 
okay? Or maybe we could install the system and then monitor it for the client for a couple of months. So that's something you could put in the package in your proposal. You know, one of the lines could be, this price includes um, soiling um, uh, protection for three months and where you'll go and monitor their system uh, frequently to see how much it affects. Um, but it is really quite difficult. But you can get a, a, a larger view of it by saying, okay, I'm in the middle of the desert. I'm going to have a lot of soiling. Or, okay, I'm in a built-up residential area. There's, there's concrete everywhere. There's not going to be as much dust. So so you can kind of get a feel for where, where soiling should be. Um, thank you, Dinsa, for your for your for your um, for your thanks and, and comments. Um, I think uh, I don't see any more questions coming through. So I'd like to thank everyone for your attendance today. The slides will be sent out, and eventually we're going to get a recording on YouTube as well. So um, if you have any questions, contact me, uh, Michael M at Seawood.com. That's Michael M at seawood.com and do be aware we have distributors everywhere these are available worldwide so i can put you in touch with your local distributor or indeed if you're in the united states you can come to us here uh, we include online training with every purchase so we can tell you how to use it when to use it what to use it for we cover ivy curve tracing solar o and m techniques we do cover a lot with our free training that's included with the instrument so again no uh, questions there so Thank you very much for your time this afternoon. I uh, hope you have a great weekend wherever you are and uh, see you again on the next one. Thank you.